Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at our first element for our 2D solid, which is the constant strain triangle. And specifically, we're going to be determining the shape functions for that element and how it fits in to our stiffness matrix. So to start off, let's look at our constant strain triangle, which is a simple triangle that's composed of three nodes. And we'll just call those nodes one, two, and three. Now, if you recall, our goal is to define the stiffness matrix, which we had defined in a previous video as the integral over our element, which in this case, this here is our omega. And the integral is of B transpose D B D omega. And the big thing here is that these B matrices are composed of derivatives of our shape functions with respect to X and Y. So just as we have for all of our one dimensional elements, we are going to define our u and v as sums of our shape functions multiplied by our nodal displacements. The issue here is that it's somewhat difficult to define a shape function in a consistent way on this element, which could be oriented in any way in space. So what we're going to do instead is build a simpler triangle in a different coordinate system, which we will call Xi and eta. And this triangle will have nodes at predefined locations. So node one is going to be at zero, zero. Node two is going to be at Xi equals one and eta equals zero. And then node three is going to be at Xi equals zero and eta equals one. Now, here's the trick. We need to create a procedure to turn this simple triangle into this arbitrary triangle. Well, that procedure is known as mapping. And so for every point on our simple triangle, we need to know how to find how that maps over to a point in the X, Y coordinate system. And so essentially we are building a function X, which is a function of C and eta and a function for Y, which is also a function of C and eta. In other words, we're actually going to be building an X, which is also a sum of shape functions multiplied by nodal values. Just this time, it's going to be the nodal X values. And we'll do the same thing for y. Now, using the same shape functions for both our nodal locations and displacements has a special name. We call that an isoparametric formulation. Iso here just means same, and parametric comes from the word parameter. So we're using the same parameters to describe both our positions and our displacements. Now that we have all of that in mind, we can go ahead and write the shape functions that we need on this element. Psi one needs to be one at node one and zero for the other two nodes. Well, we can write that pretty quickly. That's just gonna be one minus Xi minus eta. Psi two needs to be one here and zero for both of these. Well, that's just gonna be the function Xi and then psi three is just going to be the function eta. So these get to be very, very simple shape functions. Now, again, our goal is to find the partials of these size with respect to X and Y. So let's give that a try. We're going to take the psi DX and expand it using the chain rule. So we get d psi d xi multiplied by the derivative of xi with respect to x, 
And then we add in the contribution from Ada as well. The y derivative looks very similar. So these d psi d c and d psi d eta terms are really easy to calculate, right? That's almost trivial. Unfortunately, the d c d x term is almost impossible to calculate. So these four are very, very hard to find. Instead of using the straightforward approach where we take the chain rule here, we're actually going to have to be a little bit clever. And our cleverness in this case is actually to write the chain rule of the things that we can find easily. So we'll find d psi d c. And this is going to be equal to the partial of psi with respect to x multiplied by dx d c. And then we'll add the partial of psi with respect to y multiplied by dy d c. And then we'll do the same thing for eta. So now these values are trivial. We can find dx dc and dx d eta without too, too much trouble because whenever we take a derivative of those, we just take derivatives of our shape functions, which like we said was trivial. And we can then solve for d psi dx and d psi dy using matrix inversion. We write this as a vector d psi dx d psi d eta, which is equal to a matrix of our dx dx and similar terms. And that's going to be multiplied by the d psi dx and d psi dy that we're looking for. Now, whenever we have a matrix that transforms from one space, one coordinate system into another, that matrix has a special name, and it's known as the Jacobian. And so what we're going to do is we are going to invert this Jacobian and multiply it by these known values. And that will allow us for each of our i's to find d psi i dx and d psi i dy. Now we're set up in a place where everything on the right hand side of the equation is known and all we need to do is determine what these derivatives are. First off, let's find the derivatives of psi 1 with respect to c. We're just taking the derivative of c of this function, and so that's just going to end up being a negative 1. d psi 1 d eta is also negative 1. And then for psi 2, the derivative of c is equal to 1, and the derivative of eta is equal to 0. And then finally for psi 3, it's the opposite of that. The derivative with c is equal to 0, the derivative of with respect to eta is equal to 1. Now, whenever we're calculating the derivative of x, it helps to go ahead and write out the entire thing. So x is going to be equal to 1 minus c minus eta times x1 plus c times x2 plus eta times x3. And so dx dc is just going to be x2 minus x1, and dx d eta is x3 minus x1. And to find the same for y, we just replace each of those x's with y's. So just as a quick example, let's do i is equal to 1. We can find d psi 1 dx and d psi 1 dy by taking these values. So dx dc is just x2 minus x1, dx d eta, x3 minus x1, and then the same for y. And that matrix is inverted. And d psi 1 dc is just negative 1. And the same is true for d psi 1 d eta. 
And so all we really need to do in order to find this for i equals 1 is just invert this 2 by 2 matrix. Now, one result of using the constant strain triangle is that the Jacobian is constant. And since we're having to integrate over our domain, this makes our life really easy. So all of the derivatives of our shape functions and the derivatives in our Jacobian are constant, which means that whenever we're writing this integral, we can actually just say that our final result is that our stiffness matrix is our area multiplied by our thickness multiplied by this matrix multiplication. Now for higher order elements, this is not going to be quite as simple. And so we're going to introduce something called quadrature that allows us to make these integrals somewhat easy. So in the future, be on the lookout for videos where we actually find the stiffness matrix for a sample triangular element, and then also for videos where we will be looking at the shape functions for more complicated elements. In any case, I hope this video was helpful, and I will catch you next time.